month of March, which for many that means spring break. So all the trying students are off to spring break this week. Matthew's down uh, on a mission trip and uh, around Gulf Shores area. So make sure you pray in for the CCH uh, mission trip teams. Uh, they've got one, I believe, to Grundy Mountain Mission and then the other to uh, Gulf Shores. And these aren't just vacations to them. They're going out and they're reaching out to, to students on spring break uh, and really doing amazing things. They're it's always cool to hear uh, their missions wrap-ups uh, at their Tuesday night worship <clears throat> after their spring break trips. It's just great to see uh, what God is doing through those at, at the Christian Campus House at Trine. And with March coming in, it uh, means also many transitions for others, transitions to spring sports, uh, maybe all of the, the you know, Valentine's Day decorations switch to the green St. Patrick's Day decorations. Uh, the let it snow stuff on the stage will melt as it gets into spring. Uh, but just to celebrate the, the transitions as we see uh, spring slowly coming around. Uh, and that also means there are also uh, other opportunities uh, to get involved with. Once again, we've still got our winter spring camp for uh, junior and senior high students. Uh, that's next weekend. There's still time to RSVP for that or to to, to register for that. It's always a great weekend. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. And then also registration for summer camp uh, has opened up. So make sure you look into that uh, and, and check with our office if you'd like uh, our, our church code as well to get a, a discount with that. Because uh, it's hard to believe that registration's already open for camp. But before you know it, spring's here. And that just means before you know it, summer is here. Uh, time moves, moves pretty quickly. Uh, but uh, God is the same throughout, and he is always faithful to us. So let's go to him in prayer this morning. Father God, we thank you for this day. Uh, we thank you for this opportunity you've given us to praise and worship you. Uh, God, we thank you for the gift of community that you've given us, that we can uh, gather and, and connect with, with other believers, whether that's over coffee and donuts or, or just catching up uh, on life. God, we pray that you bless uh, our, our congregation this morning, bless uh, our time together, help us to grow closer to each other and to grow closer to you. And it's in your son's precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we begin in worship. breaks the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. Your life that I will be 
strength in Peter's small child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. took up the cross and died for us. And in doing so, he made our sins, he, he cast them aside, and he made us as white as snow. That renewed holiness, that renewed life that he has given us, paid for with a price. And so, God, we thank you for that. We pray that as we're about to take communion, we remember that sacrifice and honor you because of it and glorify you in all that we do. And it's in your son, Jesus' precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, church. That was uh, a nice blessing this morning to praise God together. Um, welcome to Pleasant View, and um, 
it just seems like it's a good morning. So I uh, just want to let you know that. Um, so we will um, partake of the elements together um, as one body, and I'll direct that. And if you don't have your elements right now, they're by the doors that you entered at, and you'll have time when we reflect that you can go grab those. Um, a while back, I read through the whole Bible, um, and he's like, oh, that's a great accomplishment. And I don't tell you how long it took me to do it, though. Um, and it was one of those things that there was seasons of drought where I just wouldn't read anything for a long period of time. And then eventually I get back on the bandwagon and finally made it all the way through. And I took um, kind of the neat thing I have about it, though, is I took notes when I went through. And all I would do is I read a verse or a section of verses that I liked and I'd write the reference down. And I have a couple pages just full of random references. And I try and leave little notes to know what I was thinking when I wrote it down, like, oh, this is showing God's love, or this is showing different things. And um, so if you do, I do challenge you to try and read through the Bible if you haven't. It does um, show you the character of God in a different way, um, just reading through it like that. And I encourage you to leave yourself some notes that you can come back to eventually. And, you can think, man, I have no idea what I was thinking when I read that. Or you can think, wow, this is still holding that same truth that I was thinking in that moment. Um, anyway, what I'm going to be um, reading from today was kind of, I went through one of those pages and kind of took some of those references out, and I'm going to be reading those to you today. Um, and so they're, they're not all one unified message, but hopefully you can get some truth out of them. Um, the first one I'm going to read is from Proverbs uh, 28, 13 on forgiveness. He who conceals his sins does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. And um, I just found, I don't know, in my life I find that that's kind of hard to confess your sin to others, especially if it's between me and my wife, and it just seems like it's an easier path to just forget about it, I'm trying to move on, let's move on, I don't want to get into it, but um, there is real um, goodness in um, bringing it up and getting that forgiveness. Um, the next one, Psalms uh, 25, there's a section of verses in there I'm going to read. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful for those who keep the demands of his covenant. For the sake of your name, O Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. Who then is the man that fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way chosen for him. He will spend his days in prosperity and his descendants will inherit the land. The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. My eyes are ever on the Lord, for only he will release my feet from the snare. And then um, also there's another section this week, and um, well, that I'm going to read. And this week, um, my household was sick. And um, it kind of spread throughout us, and then we all got infected again later in the week somehow by ourselves or whatever. And um, it was pretty, pretty bad, but um, I can tell you that I saw God through that, which is weird. Um, and it was probably one of the most violent sicknesses I've ever had and one of the most miserable. It didn't last a long time necessarily, but the intensity was like the highest I've ever had. And I'm in the middle of getting this violent sickness. And um, I was just thinking about, oh my gosh, this is torture. And um, I was thinking, I have, a, I have a pretty low pain tolerance. And I was thinking, <laughs> I was thinking there's no way I could have actual literal torture done on me because I just wouldn't make it. And um, that's what I was thinking. And then I was thinking about Christ on the cross and I was like, oh my gosh, like I can't even do this. And, I can't, you know, I don't even like to think about a lot of the misery that he went through because it's just too much for me. But it, anyway, this passage kind of sums, talks about that too. Um, in Isaiah 52, see, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as, just as there were many who 
appall who were appalled at him. His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man, and his form marred beyond human likeness. So will he sprinkle many nations. Um, and then the last one I want to read, um, I think kind of is going to lead us towards communion. It's about Christ saving us. It's from Isaiah 53. Um, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities and punishment the punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Um, and I just think there's a lot of truth in what that's saying, and it just, it describes it so much better than I could, and it comes from God. Um, let's pray to him. Oh God, we are just thankful for the ways that um, you direct us back to you. We're thankful for your word and how it can point us towards you. And uh, just the truth that it can hold when um, it seems like life just beats us down, that we can come back to your word and it's always there and it's always true. And um, just how it can diffuse situations that we can't otherwise because um, your word makes more sense than anything else. Um, we just thank you for your sending your son. We thank you for, for the forgiveness that, that we get. We thank you for the peace that we get through forgiveness and that. Um, this turmoil that is in our souls can be released and we can have peace. And, um, just pray today that we would just seek that out. I'm going to read that last section for us again before we partake. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. And that's what we're celebrating today with communion, Christ on the cross. Um, so let us partake of the bread that represents his body. And also the juice that represents his, his blood that was spilled for us. And I'll pray for our offering. God, again, we just thank you that we can come here today, that we can have peace worshiping you in our souls, and as we do, that we um, give back to you today. We just pray that um, the church would be fruitful, and that it would multiply, and that um, we would um, give these gifts out of good hearts, and that um, the church would got, find good ways to use them, as well as um, that our missions would prosper in your son. In, in Jesus' name, amen. Good to see everybody here today. My name is Michael Boer. I'm the part-time preacher here at Pleasant View. <laughs> 
Good to be back with you. A um, lot of stuff in the bulletin. I'm not going to go through it. But one thing, the baby bottles are here. This is a month again. We collect money for compassion pregnancy. You can put checks in here. You can put $100 bills. You can put change. But anyway, take one and make sure you fill it out. It's a great, great ministry that we need to be supporting. Good to have the Bartons here with us today. I didn't know they were going to be here, but glad they're here with us. Um, handouts. Um, in the bulletin, one of them is about the Easter Sunday flowers. We're going to have lilies and tulips again this year. You can donate one in memory of or in honor of. That's not on there, but you can do it in honor of someone also. We'll have that changed uh, next week, so um, you can take care of those also. Valentine's Day. Do you guys take, do, a good, do, you do a good job on Valentine's Day, Stephen? Or should I ask Sylvie? What do you think, Sylvie? <laughs> Okay, um, we were in Florida, and I took some of Jeff Cook's advice. Um, took her out to eat at a real nice place for lunch. We went to see the Chosen series at a movie theater that night. But I went and got some gas early in the morning because I knew we were going to be running around a little bit. And um, while I was at the gas station, they had uh, this Valentine's stuff. I remember what Jeff said, great place to shop. So I walked over there, and they already had half price on this stuff. So I talked to the lady that was behind the counter. I said, you're trying to help guys out. It's not after Valentine's Day, but on Valentine's Day, you've got stuff marked half price. Well, she pulled this big old rose out. She said, it's $7. I'll give it to you for 4 I said, I ain't going to pay $4 for that thing. How about 3 I said, no. How about 2 I said, no. How about 1 I said, no. She said, how about a quarter? So I gave her a dollar. Look how thrilled Cindy was. <laughs> That's a sweet gift for a buck at a gas station on Valentine's Day. Now, that doesn't end the story. We go watch The Chosen, and I go get the truck, because Cindy's still hobbling around, come up to pick her up, and it's a long movie. We, we saw two of the sessions. The other one starts today for all of Series 4, and I'm going to try to find it. She's going to go see it tonight. But it's about three hours plus with a break in between. They show three one-hour shows. It's great. But anyway, we leave, and there's nobody left in the theater. All the other shows had emptied, and I pick her up, and she gets, I start to, she gets in. She said, there's an old guy sitting in there. I really think he needs a ride home. Now, my first thought wasn't, I'm a Christian preacher. I, you know, compassion, all that kind of stuff. I said, does he look like he'll shoot us? She said, no, I don't think so. So I, I go in there, and I hear him talking on the phone. And, and he's debating with somebody. I didn't know who it was. And he said, well, wait a minute. And I said, my wife and I will be glad to take you home. So he said, well, there's some gentleman that's going to bring me home. He hung up. And this guy's old. And if I'm saying he's old, he's old. I had to almost help him in the back of the truck. His wife had left early and left the dude at the theater. They lived 10 miles away, and she wouldn't come and get him. <laughs> I thought, you're not having a very good Valentine's Day, buddy. And uh, so, so we drive him there, and we have some conversation. And I wish it was daylight. Because we went into a gated security guard high-end communities where he lived. And I uh, took him back to his house. And he said, I want to give you some money. I said, no, don't. I said, I, I'm glad to do it for you. We ended up giving me 20 bucks. And I thought, I'm, I'm a terrible person. I thought, good grief, you live in this place. You ought to at least give me 100 bucks. But anyway, <laughs> I didn't say that. I, I didn't say that. I'll be honest. I kind of thought it a little bit, you know. So he wasn't having a real good bout. So if any of you guys think you messed up on Valentine's Day, use that as your guide. Because the wife left him at the theater. He can't hardly walk. He calls Uber. They wanted him to walk through the parking lot across the street before they would pick him up. And so I kind of did a compassionate thing, but it's mostly on Sunday. Because my first thought was, number one, is he going to shoot us? Is he going to take our truck? But then when I saw him, I thought, I can handle this guy. But anyway, <laughs> great Valentine's Day. Hope you all had a good one, too. Uh, she's not home yet, in case you're wondering where she's at. She's got a good friend she went to high school with that lives in Inverness. I dropped her off there. Um, the dog and I came on home. I brought the dog with me because I know that means she will come home. And um, she called me Friday morning. She said, where are you at? And I said, I don't know. She said, what do you mean you don't know? I said, well, I'm somewhere between Cincinnati and Dayton. I said, I just woke up. She said, what? I said, I'm in a rest area. She said, you didn't get a motel room? I said, no. She said, you think I'm going to pay a hundred and some bucks for me and the dog to sleep in a motel room? We just stopped three times at rest areas, once at Bucky's. Great place when you've never been to Bucky's. But anyway... So, so we, get, we get home and all that, and it was, a, it was a fun trip, and we appreciate the time, appreciate Stephen and Matthew and all they did, uh, picking up everything while I was gone. Okay, John 15, 
1 through 10. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word, word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown in the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you may bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father loves me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. Now, verse 5, one more time there. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, if you watch much sports, and if you have over the years, you know there seems to be this ongoing scandal, if you will, enhancement drugs, steroids, things like that. You know, some of the heroes, when I was growing up, later on you found out they were using all kinds of drugs and steroids and stuff like that. And it seems like when that point came, a lot of them were doing it because they were trying to recover from a terrible injury or they were getting later on in their careers and they were trying to keep up with the young guys and all that thing. But for whatever reason, they just felt like they needed some extra boost. Well, sometimes you just need a little strength. You need something extra to get you through. Uh, the people that make various products understand this. You, you go into any gas station or anything like that, and you see all these energy supplements, 5-Hour Energy, Joel Red Bull gives you wings. You know, who doesn't need that? Um, you remember that Pepsi commercial from years ago? about Pepsi Max, and the commercial was all about wake up. You got that ready, Chris? Hit her back there. I want you, I want, you'll remember it once you start seeing it. <laughs> Supposed to give you the extra strength. Now, the first time I saw that commercial, and even since then, I thought to myself, maybe we ought to put some of that in the communion juice. <laughs> you know, sometimes when I look around and I'm preaching, I see some of this head nodding, you know, and stuff like that. Uh, I'm sure, Michael, you've never noticed that because your sermons are just, you know. But anyway, I thought, man, if we put a little of that Pepsi Max in there, get a little bit more going, cool anything like that. But unfortunately, we, we need a little boost now and then. People turn to drugs, herbal remedies, all these different things. But as Christians, we should know this. For the areas of life that really require extra strength, the most challenging areas of our life, you can't find any remedy at Walgreens or CVS your doctor can't write you a prescription for anything that's going to give you what you really need during those times. Now, it would be great if there was something when we had a real big challenge in our life that we could get a prescription for or, or we could buy over the counter, take that pill, drink that drink, and, and it would get us through that crisis time within our lives. M maybe it'd be nice if we swallowed some kind of a pill and all of a sudden you had that strength to go to that next door neighbor you've always wanted to and invite him to come to church to witness to him. Or maybe take some kind of a drink that will give you that strength to be more 
patient with your kids, with your family. It would maybe help you produce the fruit in your life that the Bible talks about. Uh, this idea of being patient, gentle, kind, self-controlled, loving, all these different things. Wouldn't it be great if we could just get something over the counter that would help us do that? But we can't do that, can we? So where do we find strength for life's greatest challenges? Well, I'm going to start a series today that's going to go through up into Easter, looking at the book of John, where Jesus simply says to his disciples, I am. And then he tells us what the I am is all about. He's talking to them, but I believe he's talking to us just as much today. Um, this is something that they need to be taught because they needed to understand, as we do, that we have to relate to Christ because at different times in our lives, these points are going to come up. And the only thing that's going to get us through it is our relationship to him. So the question we're going to address today is, who is going to give me strength? And Jesus' answer is, I am. I am the vine. I am going to give you the strength you need. Now, let's put it in context. If we go back into chapter 14, uh, we see Jesus in the upper room with his followers. And, and he knew his time was coming very close as far as here on earth. Uh, we see him trying to teach them. He instituted the Lord's Supper. He, he, he washed their feet trying to get the idea of being a, a, a servant. But it seems like he's being very careful in the words and the teachings that he's choosing because he realizes his time with them physically is drawing to a quick close and he wanted to get some points across. Now, as a preacher, I've done so many funerals over the years and I've listened to so many people talk to me about those points in their lives. I I've had someone say that I waited for a lifetime for my dad to just simply say, I love you. I knew he loved me. But to hear him say, I love you, and, and he did, right before he died. Or we find an interesting time when a mother, her, her dying words may be to her adult children, I've heard this, please go back to church. Please get involved in church again. I want to see you in heaven. A husband may say to his wife, I'm sorry for not being there more. Marcia did this. She knew her time was drawing very short. Her cancer was rapidly overtaking her mind and she had a quiet time privately with each one of the kids she had one with me I have no idea what she said to either one of the kids I've never asked them but I know it was a meaningful moment and, and words were chosen very carefully because they were going to be forever remembered at that point in time and this is one of those moments Jesus knows that. He, he knows that he doesn't have much time left with his disciples, and he knows the kind of challenges that they're going to face. Now, like I said, in chapter 14, he, he washed their feet. He talked to them about being a servant, but he also said to them, in just a little while, the world will no longer see me. And, and I can imagine he looked at their faces and saw anxiety, maybe perplexed. And he goes on to say, I'm not going to leave you alone. I, I won't leave you as orphans. I am leaving, but I won't leave you alone. And now they exit the upper room. And I'm sure there was silence. He, he was leading them. They didn't know. But he was leading them to the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus wasn't just talking about them and thinking about them. He was thinking about us also. He knows the challenges they would face. He knows the challenge we would face as we go through life trying to do our best to live an exemplary life that shows Jesus to others. They needed strength. Well, first of all, we're going to look at the different areas where we really need strength. One area where we need strength is to help us get through what we just can't get through on our own. There are times in life when something happens, and you may think, I didn't think this had ever happened to me. I, I didn't think I would ever go through something like this. Now, the disciples were going to experience that, not just in the coming days, uh, but as they continued to serve, they were going to be persecuted. They were going to be pressured because they followed Jesus. Tradition tells us that all of them would die some kind of a bad death, for the faith, except for John, who was exiled 
to the Isle of Patmos. So they needed strength to endure the suffering and persecution they were going to go through. Jesus knew that. Maybe you're going through something like that right now. Maybe somebody watching or will be watching might be going through something like that. What you're experiencing, you never thought would happen to you in your life. Always somebody else, but not to me. Like I said, I know the stories. I've heard the stories. I continue to hear the stories. Another pregnancy test comes back negative. Another month without a job. Another night where you don't know where your child's sleeping. House is foreclosed on. Spouse is unfaithful. Job is lost. And the list goes on and on and on. Where am I going to find the strength? I, I, I can't get through this on my own. And I guarantee you, if this hasn't happened to you yet, it will. It's as simple as that. You will go through that in this life. Where do we find the strength for times like that? Another area where we really need strength is to help us not do what we know we shouldn't. We're constantly being tempted. And it takes so much strength to overcome temptation. Our, our heart's right. We want to do the right thing. We desire to do the right thing, but we stumble. We, we fall. We, we fail. I've been frustrated. I've talked to people who were so frustrated because they were tired of trying and failing and trying and failing. They want to do what's right. They wanted to overcome this, but they just didn't have the strength. Most people are like that. We're not evil people. I don't talk to evil people. It's just that we don't want to do the opposite of what God tells us to do, but we're just weak. And sometimes the temptation overcomes it. We, we don't want to be the type of person who, who cheats, who lies, who orders that movie late at night, who swears. They don't want to be that person. And if we're honest, we'd all admit that we've been there. Maybe we're there right now. Where do you find the strength to not do what you know you shouldn't? Another area where we need strength is to help us do what we know we should do. We have this picture in our minds. We just have this idea of who we want to be, the type of person, the characteristics that we want to have in our lives. But again, where do we find the strength? It sounds good. We, we sit maybe in church or sensual class or maybe a small group, and we hear something, you say, great, I'm going to be more patient with my kids, more gracious than my spouse, kinder to my neighbor. But we don't have the strength. Where do we find that strength? Well, we find Jesus here, thinking of his disciples, thinking about us and the strength that we're going to need, that they're going to need. They leave the upper room. They're walking towards the Garden of Gethsemane, and, and I'm sure it was just silence because Jesus just said, I'm not going to be around much longer. And no doubt they're thinking, what in the world are we going to do without Jesus here, our, our leader? They still didn't comprehend, understand this whole idea of what his kingdom was going to be. And they're thinking, we can't overcome Rome. We can't do what we want to do without Jesus. And I'm sure there was silence. Now, he knows what awaits him. Betrayal, arrest, beatings, death. And he's winding them down the path and then up towards the Garden of Gethsemane. No doubt he's thinking, what do I say? What do they really need to hear? What do I want to express to him? And I can almost see him stopping, as we read here in John 15, and saying, as maybe pointed to a vineyard. And there in verse 1 he says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He realizes the most important thing they need to understand is their relationship to him. What they are, what we are, the branches, and he the one that gives life, strength, is the vine. And when we're not connected to the vine, we don't have the strength to do what we want to do, to overcome these weaknesses, these temptations. We don't have the strength to do what we feel like we should be doing. And the one message he wants to make clear with his time that is left is you stay connected. You stay connected because all the power all the life comes from the vine. It's not in the branch, it's in the vine. Well, 
that leads us to how do we find that strength? Well, first of all, we acknowledge that we're just a branch. We're not the vine. You've probably heard this before. Um, one of the most dreaded questions if you go to an interview, and I'll be honest, I was thinking about all the college kids, and I know I didn't realize they were going to be on break, but I'm going to go ahead and use it. Maybe they might watch it later on. But anyway, um, one of the most dreaded questions at a job interview is this. What is your greatest weakness? Man, you're in trouble when they ask you that. How do you answer that question, what is your greatest weakness? Because depending on the job you're applying for, if you tell them what your your greatest weakness really is, you're probably not going to get the job. So you might say something like, well, my greatest weakness is I'm a perfectionist. And I'm too hard on myself. I work more than I should. I put in more hours than I should. Or you might say, I just work too hard at my job. And life gets out of balance. Well, why don't they say, well, tell us what your greatest weakness is and how you've overcome it. Oh, man. Now you're really messed up. You know, how are you going to do that? Uh, You can say, well, I tend to be a very task-oriented person. And I've learned that the best way to get something done is to delegate and work with other people. Sounds pretty good. You try and turn that weakness into a strength. Now, if you're applying for a job as an accountant, you wouldn't say, well, my greatest weakness is I'm not very good with numbers. That wouldn't be a good thing to say. that's, That's not the right answer. So you come up with a weakness that has nothing to do with the job that you're applying. Nothing to do. They say, what's your greatest weakness? You might say, well, you know, I'm kind of injury on the, prone on the basketball court, so I, I stay away from basketball now. Or, you know, I just don't look good in the color green. So I try real hard not to wear the color. You know, you just say something that has nothing to do with the job that you're applying for. Now, why am I telling you this? Sidebar, Lee, come on. You're complaining about being so sick and so much in pain. Your wife has had a kid. Man, we, you, there's some things I should have told you ahead of time, buddy. I didn't just tell you anything you needed. I'm sorry. Anyway, it was, it was a great community meditation, but I mentally laughed just for a second. I thought, Lee, come on. That ain't cutting no ice here. But anyway, why am I telling you this? It's because that's the kind of mentality that a lot of us go through in life. You, you put up this perception that we're strong, that we've got it all together. That's what we do a lot of times on Sunday when we come in here. We act like no problems. I'm strong enough. I don't need any help. We put out this false perception that we've got everything under control, that we've got our stuff together. But the Bible teaches us that when we acknowledge our weakness, we're in that perfect place to receive the strength we need from God. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 27. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And he chose the weak things. He chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. So when we acknowledge our weakness, when we acknowledge that we can't do it on our own, then we're ready for God to give us the strength that we need. There's so many examples in Scripture like this. Abraham was old. Leah was unattractive. Moses stuttered. Elijah was depressed. Jeremiah was stressed. Jonah was cowardly. John the Baptist was eccentric, to say the least. I love the way they just showed John the Baptist in The Chosen. Uh, Peter could be pretty impulsive. Martha worried a lot. Zacchaeus was dishonest and popular with the people. Thomas had doubts. Paul was in poor health. Timothy was timid. And and the the list just goes on and on throughout Scripture where God and Jesus chose weak people, imperfect people, the weak things of the world to shame the strong to accomplish his purpose. Now, understand, I am not saying that we should purposely try to make ourselves weak. I'm not saying that at all. We're already weak. We're just simply the branch. That's all I am. That's all you are. We humble ourselves before God, and then he infuses the strength that we need into each one of us. It's this relationship between the vine and the branches that's so important He knew the apostles needed to get that right. We need to get that right today. The power, the life, the strength comes from the vine. Jesus says, I am the vine. 
Life comes from me. Acknowledge your complete dependence on me. And that's hard to do. Verse 1, he said, I am the true vine. Now, why did he say the true vine? There's a lot of other false vines out there. There's a lot of other things where we think we can find strength. They look like they're life-giving. They look like they're going to give us what we need, but they don't. They always disappoint. <sighs> Hundreds of self-help help books that are put out every year has this theme of you can be the vine. You are not the branch. Strength comes from you. Strength comes from within. Remember in Exodus chapter 3, we find Moses just being a shepherd. Kind of on the back side of life, if you might say. You know the story. And all of a sudden, he sees this bush that's burning. And he starts going towards it. And God said, take your shoes off. This is holy ground. So he takes his shoes off, and he goes up. And you remember what God said there in chapter 3? He said, you're going to go to Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the world. And you're going to be my instrument to get millions of your fellow countrymen out of slavery. <laughs> remember what Moses said? Are you crazy? I can't do that. I, I, I'm just a shepherd. I don't have very good speech. There's no way in the world I can do that. Now, God did, didn't say, yeah, you do. He didn't say, Moses, you're strong enough. Moses, you're gifted enough. Moses, you're talented enough. He didn't do anything like that to try to boost Moses' ego. Remember what God said? I will be with you. Enough said. I'll be with you. The call was not for Moses to find his strength from within. That's what God was not trying to build him up for. The call was for him to find his strength from above, from God. That's where strength comes from. The Amplified Version puts Philippians 4.13 like this. I have strength for all things in Christ who empowers me. I am ready for anything and equal to anything through him who infuses his inner strength into me. I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. There in John 15, 2, Jesus said, He, God the gardener, cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be more fruitful. Now, when you read that for the first time, you might think, now, wait a minute. I, I understand the idea that the branch is not bearing any fruit. It's, if it's dead, you cut it off. But a branch that's bearing fruit, why are you pruning that? I, I don't quite understand that, God. Well, if you've ever raised fruit trees, anything like that, you know, trees, you, you prune it to help it grow stronger, don't you? I believe that brings us to our second step, accept God's pruning in our lives. Maybe God allows. I believe he does. Some of those difficulties in life so that we can learn more dependence on him. Maybe he's allowing some of those physical challenges, health challenges, because he wants us to realize how weak we are so that his strength can flow, us, flow through us more perfectly. Maybe he's allowing some difficulties in a relationship because he wants to develop the fruit of patience in your life. So maybe a lot of times these difficult challenges we find ourselves going through is God pruning us so that we'll come out on the other side stronger. Hebrews chapter 12 says, No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. James says in chapter 1, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its works so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. The only way we're really going to get God's strength coming through us to bear fruit the way he wants us to, is to allow him to go through some of these pruning processes. And sometimes when we're going through these tough difficulties, knowing we get our strength from God, maybe we should ask ourselves, is this an opportunity for me to grow in Christ? Is this an opportunity for me to show my strength, to show my faith, to show my dependence upon God to those around me that are watching me go through this difficult time? One more thing. Finding the strength in God means that you abide. Now, in the NIV that we use, uh, we study from, the word is used 11 times, and it really re means to remain. Uh, excuse me, I got just a backwards there. My brain's not going here. It's translated remain in the NIV, but the real word is abide, and it's used 11 times in this passage. Now, 
That's not a word I get real excited about, abide, remain. Because we, we want to do something. We, we see a problem, we see something going on, and we want to grab that thing and take care of it ourselves. But God says, no, you just, you just abide. Well, I want a verb that says something like, um, suck it up, stick it out, start today. But Jesus says, no, abide. Abide. You see, we live in a society where we think we have to do something, we have to be productive in order to achieve anything. And we translate that over into our faith, thinking if we really want to receive God's strength, we've got to be doing something about it. We've got to be productive. Jesus says, no, it's in the connection, from the vine to the branch. You just abide. You know, we think if I produce enough at work, I'll get a promotion. Score enough points, I'll get more playing time. Uh, if I don't score, score high enough on the test, I'm not going to get into the college I want to. Everything it seems like we knew, know in our society is all based upon production. If I produce it enough in my life, if I can bear enough fruit for God, then he's going to accept me. There's even some religions that's based on that. You may have grown up in a church. You may have grown up in a home where it was all about production. It was all about doing something. It was about the fruit and not anything about the connection. The scripture here tells us if we really want God's strength, we abide. We remain. God is not looking for more and more and more from any one of us as much as he's looking for more and more of us in our connection to him. I want you to think about this just for a moment. Think about that, and if you've ever had grapes or anything like that in the pruning, you think about that connection point where the vine, the main part, and all the branches start going off. I, I planted a couple, three or four grapevines a couple years ago at the house. And you know what I look at all the time? I want to see how those branches are doing. I want to see how far they've grown. If they're starting to spread, I'm hoping this next year I might actually see some grapes on them. Uh, if not, they may be in trouble. But anyway, uh, that's what we look at. But we need to focus on that connection. How healthy is it? How does it look? And when we walk in obedience to Christ, when we gather together to worship, when we study in a small group, when we pray together, when we pray individually, that connection gets stronger and stronger and stronger. If you're growing grapes or anything like that, you go to the nursery and you say, what kind of fertilizer can I get to strengthen the vine, to help those branches grow? And I'll buy it and I'll use it. God tells us, you want the branches to grow, you want to bear fruit, you want to live that Christian life, abide. Stay connected. Worship. Pray. Read my word. That's the message. Jesus doesn't have much time, and he just says, connect, remain, abide. Abide in me. In just a few moments, when they come and arrest me, you abide. When they beat me and nail me to a tree, abide. When you watch me die, abide. When they come after you because you're a follower, abide. When your portfolio takes a tumble, abide. When your car breaks down, when nothing seems to be going right, when your spouse disappoints you, when your child breaks your heart, when you lose your job, when people make fun of you because you're standing up for your Christian beliefs, abide. Stay connected, be the branch, and let our life, our strength, come from the vine. That's what he wanted to get across to the disciples. That's what he wants to get across to us. I was trying to think of a picture that would really capture this, that you would maybe keep in your mind. And <laughs> I, I keep joking. They say the body is still in there somewhere. I don't know where. I lost it a number of years ago. But I used to run all the time, ran marathons. There, there, there wasn't a weekend went by when the weather was decent. I wasn't either running a 5 or a 10 or a 15K. Um, I know you look at me now and say, yeah, right. I've got pictures to prove it. But anyway, <laughs> if you were much of a runner, you remember the story of Dick and Rick Hoyt. It was a father and a son, and they did triathlons. Now, you might think, what's the big deal? Father and son doing triathlons together. Well, here, here's the point. Um, Ricky was born with cerebral palsy. He can do nothing on his own. But he told his dad he wanted to, he, he said, I want to do an Iron Man. Watch the video.
bike 24, and run six more. All right, welcome everyone. But one man's got a tougher challenge than the rest, and it's not because he's one of the oldest guys here. It's because Dick Hoyt will pull, pedal, and push his son Rick, who was born without the ability to move or speak. This is how father and son spend their time together, nearly every single weekend, going back 30 years. Dick and Rick Hoyt have completed over 240 triathlons, and on their lazier Sunday afternoons, over 68 marathons, the fastest in a time just half an hour off the world record. Yes, the real world record. They say Dick Hoyt could have been an elite endurance athlete on his own. Dick's not so sure. I just don't have the desire to be out there running by myself. I think it's just something that comes from his body to my body, and it makes us go faster. Are you trying to say that you run faster pushing Rick than if you didn't run with him? Oh, yeah. He, he inspires me and he motivates me. And he's actually the athlete, and he's very competitive. He wants to win. Okay. His son can do nothing except abide. The strength, the power comes from his dad. Jesus didn't have to come to this earth. Jesus did not have to come to endure what he endured. He did not have to die upon the cross, that agonizing, horrible death. But he did it for us. And all he asked us to do is abide. Receive our strength from him. I am the true vine, is what he tells us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your strength, your love. We're thankful that we don't have to try to get through this life on our own. But rather, Father, we abide in you. And as we abide in you, as we remain in you, we find the strength that we need to live that life that exemplifies you. Without it, without your strength, without the vine, without the life we find through you, we would be so hopeless so powerless. So Father, we give you the glory. We give you all the praise and honor for the strength you give us, the love you give us, the hope, the assurance of eternal life we find through you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's be standing, shall we? In your relationship with the Lord, or if you want to put your membership here, we give you an opportunity each Sunday as we stand and close out our service.
broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh, oh God, you are my living hope. You all want to be seated just a minute? We've got a couple of young ladies that wanted to come up this morning and put their membership in. You coming up? <laughs> Gwen asked me an interesting question. She said, well, what about the church where my membership was at? You know, church where I was baptized at. And I said this. I said, I was baptized in the Whitewater Christian Church back in the late 50s. That's always going to be my home church. But I put my membership in where I'm serving. Because I think that's so important. Come on, ladies. They are afraid I was going to make them say their thing. This is Sarah Zimmer, Gwen Firestone. And they come this morning. You all know them. They've been here. How long have you been attending here, Gwen? Two years. Two years? Okay month and a half so and and these young ladies are showing us it doesn't matter what your age is you know, if you had a decision to make make the decision this has nothing to do with salvation we all know that but everything to do with they want to be identified with us and i'm so thankful they're doing that so i'll ask you to repeat together so you don't have to talk by yourself okay gwen uh that good confession i know you've already made i believe, I believe that jesus is the christ that jesus is the christ the son of the living god the son of the living god and he is, and he is my personal savior God bless you, ladies. God bless you. In a church we attend when we're down in Florida, the Englewood Christian Church, I love the preacher there. He's humorous. I like his messages. But I noticed last year, and I said something to him this year, I trust Chris to turn my microphone off when we sing the invitation hymn. He doesn't trust his sound people. He always sticks his hand in his pocket pulls it out, turns it off, puts it back in his pocket. He says, I can't sing either. And I said, brother, I'm the same way. But anyway, good to see everybody here. Michael, you guys, glad you guys are all here with us today. And, man, your girls are growing up so fast. Oh, my gosh. Now, when do you guys head back? You want, why don't you give a real quick report, if you would, please, Michael? Yeah.
Obviously, there's a great connection here, but let's be continuing in prayer. August is going to be here before we know it. Let's continue to lift them up in prayer and their support and their transition and, and all those things. And uh, what a blessing uh, that you're here with us today and the work that you're doing. What a blessing. You all have a great week.